publishers are becoming more and more reliant on online features these days, which has led to publishers to become slack with quality, causing game-breaking bugs on launch and games that have minimal or less content than was advertised. But the ability for patches and the content to come out later to fix these issues? I think it's about time someone goes back on titles of years past and asks, is it worth playing now? Who the fuck thought Mini Nukes were a good idea? I can't see SHIT! In case you didn't get the bit, we're doing Fallout 4 today. Fallout 4 is a first person shooter of some light RPG elements and base building roughly incorporated into the game. In many ways, it's a departure from the expectations set up by previous titles. Despite this, after its release in late 2015, it was highly rated by critics and players alike. Here's where I become slightly controversial, because with my 60 hours total in Fallout, I question its 88% positive rating on Metacritic and 93% positive review on Google. Not because the game is necessarily bad, but because after 15 hours on PC, I started noticing some major problems with the game. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up, motherfucker. They talking shit about my boy Fallout 4? You can shut the fuck up until I finish going through the mechanics. The shooting mechanics have vastly improved since Fallout New Vegas. This is primarily due to ID Software's work on the shooting mechanics to make them as polished as possible. ID Software is famously known for their work on Quake, Wolfenstein and Doom, so they have a small reputation for good shooters, especially if you include Wolfenstein The New Order, which was released a year earlier. I suspect a lot of the shooting mechanics were transferred from Wolfenstein due to one key glitch in the game. I say it's a glitch because, because it's a mechanic never explained in Fallout 4 and isn't very consistent. You see, in Wolfenstein, if you were next to an edge, you could ADS and peek around that corner without holding a second button. It used a visual cue in the form of a small arrow to let you know when you could do this. Fallout has the same mechanic and animation, except it's inconsistent and has no visual cue. Despite this nitpick, Fallout 4 solved my biggest issue of previous titles, which is hit registration. For whatever reason only known to the ether, in previous titles you could be dead still, have your scope pinpoint accurate, and the shot would not register a hit. This led to firing more rounds than necessary and wasting ammo. This was the primary reason for the creation of VATS, but even that was unreliable, a problem that does however continue in Fallout 4. VATS has an issue where for some strange reason your character won't fire the gun, and if they don't fire, you can't leave VATS. So you get to watch your Valiant Crusader or Wastelander die in slow motion as bullets or talons rip through their chest. Man, I love dying by game-breaking bugs. It's not a glitch. It's a feature. You can come back to me with that bullshit when you get off Creation Engine, you lazy fuck. You've been beating that outdated dead horse for 20 years. Anyway, back to the shooting. Most of the guns have some good sound design and animation when shooting. Some guns, however, the muzzle flash can make rapid shots difficult, especially on laser rifles, which don't have the option for compensators and muzzle brakes. I do have some minor problems with the reload animations for a few of the guns. The reason the bolt goes in the direction of the dominant hand is so it can keep the fucking rifle steady and have minimal movement when sniping for quicker follow-up shots and make it harder for you to be spotted. Seriously, what the fuck is a AAA games fucking up snipers? Why are you half cocking that slide? Your reload animation shows that's not enough to load around into the chamber and you only need a thumb to pull back the hammer. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. Fuck you, this is important. Fallout 4 also has a distinct lack of variety in its weapons. This could be because of all the attachments used to customise guns, but I don't think that's a reasonable excuse when its lack of variety drastically affects progression. Bethesda reuses the same model for the combat rifle and combat shotgun, with the only difference being in their barrels and larger magazines. In relation to why this affects progression, New Vegas used a 4 tier weapon system that linked to your gun skill. They can be ranked by calibre, which is a realistic way to do it. 
The earliest weapons required 0 to 25 gun skill, with the most powerful requiring 100 gun skill, with severe penalties to their stats if you use the gun without the correct level. This allowed for the devs to add a variety of weapons and weapons of the same function and act as a visual cue of your progress. Fallout 4 has no restrictions or mechanics to combat a player using a top tier gun immediately. I'll touch on this problem later on. Most guns will be using hit scan, which will give you an instant response on your shots, but certain guns like the plasma launcher, rocket launcher and fat man use a projectile based system, which just means you have to lead your target if they're moving. Overall, the shooting mechanics are a solid base for smooth gameplay, which I have a few nitpicks about, but I'll be coming back to the guns regularly due to them being connected to many features of the game. As we all know, with all RPGs, you've got to loot or die. As a serial in-game kleptomaniac, I know a thing or two about loot. Because that fuck is not nailed down, it's mine. If you're like me and explored Fallout without following the main questline, you'll discover a severe lack of towns and civilizations, so your equipment is entirely linked to your looting and crafting. The quality of your loot depends entirely on your location on the map, because Fallout 4 uses a type of difficulty grid, where the further you are from Sanctuary, the harder the enemies are, and the stronger their attacks and weapons are. The rest of looting is searching through chests, crates, etc. Some crates and doors have locks that you need to pick, with some requiring you to have reached a certain level to unlock the relevant lock picking skills. The enemies you kill in certain perks such as scavenger determine the items you'll be able to loot. You can get legendary weapons and armor with special effects such as 15% area of effect damage from legendary creatures you kill, but these are randomized, making it just an unreliable gimmick to sink time into. Unlike in Fallout New Vegas, where you could rush to certain destinations to get powerful unique weapons or armor, early on as a reward for wasting your valuable resources to get through it. I'll go into more depth when I talk about progression later on. In Fallout 4, an endgame gun would net you between 150 and 300 caps, depending on your skills, compared to 2,000 to 4,000 caps you would get in Fallout New Vegas, depending on the condition and barter skills. The big problem with this is that an item like Stimp Packs is still 60 to 80 caps each, meaning you're better off waiting on a dungeon to reset and then raiding it to get the A that you need, rather than becoming a gun dealer. When you're just starting off, you're spamming the E button to loot, but once you've hoarded enough parts to build an arsenal, the only point to looting is profit, and with most items worth pennies, and not needing to do any kind of trading to progress your arsenal, it cheapens the experience of looting to the point of you're only doing it for ammo and healing items. Crafting allows for a lot of customization. You can turn most pistols into rifles and then into machine guns. Machine guns do significantly less damage so they're not very viable. You can now have muzzle attachments to help with muzzle recoil flash and sound reduction, as well as the addition of a bayonet that allows for a stronger and quicker melee strike. The other attachments are scopes, bigger or improved magazines, stocks and barrels for more accurate and more stable shots, and caliber changes so you can shoot bigger or smaller ammo types, as well as receiver improvements to your gun, either making it fully automatic or just stronger overall. This all comes at the cost of scavenged materials and weight that's added to your weapon. Armor crafting is a major change from Fallout New Vegas, which I wasn't all that happy with. In previous titles, you would equip one set of clothing with a preset armor rating. This meant you could have some really nice looking armor sets. All that needed to be added was the ability to upgrade your armor. Now, an armor set comes in five parts, the chest, each leg, and each arm. You upgrade each individual part of two slots. The first slot increases its base stats, and the second slot allows for additional benefit, such as being lighter, stealth bonuses, explosive or radiation resistance, resistances, or extra weight capacity. I just find this way of upgrading equipment tedious, but your opinion might differ. Overall, the weapon and after crafting is a nice addition, especially for weapon customizations. The crafting system is user friendly and the stats are made quite clear so you can make an informed decision, but its implication doesn't consider player progression, which became a major issue for me. Fallout 4 has a significant improvement over previous AI enemies. 
In previous titles, they awkwardly used cover, but for the most part stayed in the open, and hit you enough just to remind you to stay behind cover. I'm assuming this was because of the dodgy hit detection previous titles had. However, Fallout 4's AI moves between cover and moves into position to get a better shot you every chance it gets, as well as throwing grenades damn accurately to get you to move out of cover, which gives you a nice bit of challenge. Animations for enemies has also improved. Human enemies will duck behind a wall or crate when they need to reload or aren't certain where you are, making your shots more difficult due to only seeing an elbow or the top of their head. Enemies such as the Yao Guai and Deathclaw will now rush you and stun you when they get the chance. Death Claws have got a series of animation that are really cool to look at, but are really irritating when actually playing. They can stun you, which causes you to stumble back a few steps, and in another animation, the Death Claw will pick you up and slam you on the ground. The problem is, your movement is slowed, and you can't fire your weapon for 5 seconds. The Death Claw is already a hard enemy to kill early on, and this stun allows it to do extra damage through extra strikes while you can't fight back. It's especially annoying when in power armor. This is a small gripe, but it feeds into a big issue about the game feeling like it's more about spectacle rather than depth. I don't have any complaints of sound design, it's all functional. So every enemy has a distinct sound to let you know what you're fighting. All machines have fitting sound effects, and most guns have a slight variation to their gunshot and slide sound effects. But there's nothing to add to the immersion of the game or give you additional information. For example, you never hear the sounds of birds chirping as you walk through a forest, or the sounds of seagulls along the coast, despite there being seagulls you can kill, or the sound of a strong wind. Again, it's functional, but not immersive. This would have to be the most well-known issue in Fallout 4, which is why I referred to it as a first-person shooter with light RPG elements. Previous fallouts gave you a list of dialogue choices that showed exactly what you would say to make you more involved in the game and allow you to consider how your character would act or how the NPC would react to that dialogue choice. Instead, Fallout 4 has four options. Yes, no, sarcastic, and question. So all dialogue for me became spam the down arrow or the A button. This limitation not only cheapens the role playing, but also stopped me from actually wanting to learn the lore. Quest lines are generally just fetch quests, with the ones that have a story to them only having one or two ways to complete them, talking your way through or murdering everyone. This is something else Fort New Vegas did better. Many quest lines you can do three or four different ways. There are plenty of videos out there that go on in depth into this and take up 20 minutes to do so. I highly suggest watching them if you're an aspiring game dev. There really isn't all that much role playing in this game. The only choices you make that matter is which faction you go into, which overall just decides what unique weapons and late game content you get. I didn't find the story all that gripping, especially knowing its plot before beginning my journey. It really felt like you are being forced down a set path, which makes for a good story driven game, but this is an open world RPG. Even status effects such as broken limbs and withdrawal are so minimal that you can ignore these issues the entire game. If your arm gets crippled, your weapon sways significantly. If your leg breaks, you can't sprint, and your walking speed is noticeably slower. Healing your limbs in Fallout New Vegas would require precious resources such as stim packs, doctor's bags, and hydra. In Fallout 4, all you need to do is wait 20 to 60 seconds for them to heal, and then once you're out of danger, sleep in a bed to restore them to max health, if you haven't already used a stim pack because you are low on health. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, what it shows is that Fallout 4 seems to be designed as a popcorn game, that you play for a few hours at a time without having to worry about any complicated mechanics. I personally prefer the old system for its greater player freedom and certainty. Settlement building is the biggest addition to Fallout 4, and its quality entirely depends on your preference. Its premise is pretty basic, you have walls, floors, and roofs of various materials, wood, metal, and concrete, which require those materials respectively to be built. You have some pre-built structures for basic huts and towers, as well as some market stalls which you can use for a veranda. Overall, there's enough structures to give you plenty of creative freedom with your base or settlement. When creating a settlement, you have to install generators to run water purifiers, lighting, alarms, and defenses. Defenses are pretty easy to set up. 
All it takes is going full Donald Trump and building a wall to funnel raiders through your front gate and into groups of torrents. If you're even lazier, you can just set a settler to activate an alarm which will cause your remaining settlers to arm themselves and fight the raiders. So remember, a polite society is an armed society. So give all your valuable settlers good guns you found in the wastelands. Now you also have to set up crops to feed your settlers, have beds for them, and if you choose, help them fight off raiders or synths. It's a simplistic bit of micromanaging that after initial setup can be ignored completely. The only benefit of the settlement building is being able to set up merchants, which you can't do unless you have 6 charisma points and reach level 14. This requires sacrificing more val valuable skills like strength for carry weight, perception for better accuracy and VAT, luck for looting, endurance for more VATS points, intelligence which affects important crafting skills and experience gain. So unless you specifically want to build a settlement and are willing to sacrifice better skills, you'll most likely not get this skill to level 20 plus because you should be seeking those perk points into charisma later on into the game. Personally, I found cleaning out the scrap from a settlement and building myself an outpost really relaxing and enjoyable. Then I tried building in different settlements that had pre-war buildings in them. I was far too kind on this part of my draft about the building itself. Trying to get a level floor or roof can be difficult due to roof connecting to the environment in really odd ways, and sometimes you'll have to remove whole walls to use a certain pre-built structure that are meant to stick together. In fact, Trying to build something as simple as a fence can be a trial in patience, because for reasons known only to the ether, they won't place where you want them to, but they will gladly ignore the laws of physics. Trying to build pillars for things like your veranda is just as ridiculous because the game doesn't give you any control over clipping or where the pillar connects. Its auto judgement system will stop it from being put where you want it to. So if a pillar is too long, it won't be placed, and you won't be able to sink the pile into the ground, and you can't double up pillars, and for some reason, it just won't work at all. If you want to renovate a pre-war house in Fallout 4, forget it. You aren't even able to remove or cover up the obviously destroyed walls, floors, and roofs, and rubble, because Bethesda was too fucking lazy to give you some more freedom. This building system works perfectly fine, as long as you only want something simple and practical, and you don't try to renovate a pre-war house. If you want anything more than that, make sure to lock up your precious valuables, rope and guns, because you'll either want to blow your fucking brains out, hug a rope, or destroy your shit. Halo Reach had a great forge mode of plenty of control around the placement of structures and the physics around them. It allowed you to turn physics and clipping on or off. It allowed you to move structures in an X, Y and Z axis with a grid system. It allowed for major adjustment through the player's movement and minor adjustments by moving the structure one point at a time on a desired axis. This system was used for rotation and allowed for limitless freedom in map design. Overall, the settlement system is a severely flawed addition. Enjoyable depending on your preferences, but the advantage is you can ignore it completely. Boy, it sounds like rant time because the progression in this game is fucking shithouse. Hell, give yourself 100 Psychojet, 500 shotgun shells and a double barrel, and you'll have top tier equipment by level 10 from bum rushing the east coast for weapons and armour. You get half that requirement if you decide to be healthy. Anyway, I had better get back to the objective points. Like every other game, you level up through combat, exploration and crafting. Now at times, this can feel rather slow to level up, as certain aspects of the game locked behind a level cap, it can be quite frustrating. Now Fallout New Vegas required skill levels, but you were given the ability to power level them, which at least lets you choose what skills you can max out through starting perks and where you placed your points into. I prefer this method because it encourages player agency, whereas the level caps in Fallout 4 feels like Bethesda has set a certain path for you. The biggest issue with player level, however, is when it comes to weapons, armour and enemies. In previous titles, equipment scaled with you as you played or were guarded by significantly difficult enemies and required skill points to allow you to use a high tier weapon effectively. Crafting is integral to Fallout 4's progression. It's an evolution of Fallout New Vegas' mod system, but unlike Fallout New Vegas, where you could get the gun mods you wanted just by having enough caps and knowing what vendor sells which mods, Fallout 4 has gun mods sold randomly. This means if you want a suppressor, you can waste hours using a bed to move time forward trying to get a suppressor for stealth without any results. 
Your only other option is to wait until level 39 to be able to craft a silencer. The reason this is such a problem for me is that it restricts player freedom by removing a viable playstyle. The main cause for this is the fact crafting is used to upgrade guns, so scaling becomes a problem if they allow players to build or buy the strongest mod straight away. But this could have been fixed by linking their spawning to certain zones or the player's level, or making mods and weapons more expensive, or making it so you define specific items or parts, or making it so a merchant would require you to do a quest to earn weapon mods that aren't the receiver. This would have been a good touch to allow players to choose their own playstyle and still have scaling artificially inserted. As I said towards the start of the video, I prefer Fallout New Vegas' tiered weapon system that require your character to gain more experience with firearms to use the bigger calibers and higher damaged weapons. I was able to get an upgraded combat rifle, second highest damage combat shotgun and a hardened bolt action rifle by level 15, which meant I was able to kill high level enemies far sooner than I should have been able to. By the time I found the assault rifle, which is a rarer gun and has a rarer ammo supply, I found my 45 cal combat rifle did 4 more damage than it when they were both at max upgrades. The 4-4 Magnum revolver does the same damage as a 50 cal sniper with a smaller and more common round. The problem with this balance is rarer and heavier ammo and weapons are equal or weaker than their counterparts found far early in the game. I had also gotten combat armor and maxed out its upgrades, so after about 30 hours where I had explored a large part of the map without doing the main quest, it felt like there was no progression left, and then I had to start finding what else to do, but unless you follow the main story, side quests are rare to come across naturally. Now is about the right time to go into enemies. You get the standard raider type enemies and synthetic humans, aka the fucking terminator, and multiple low level enemies at the easy areas of the game. Super mutants, mutant hounds and ghouls are in the easy to mid tier areas, and then gunners which are just armored civilian raiders, and creatures like the deathclaw, yaogai and giant crab things are in the mid to hard areas. The only thing that separates them is their health pool. You can fight a deathclaw in two areas and one will be weaker than the other due to the grid difficulty system. This system ruins the balance because it destroys the hard lines that you had in previous titles. In Fallout New Vegas, they had made deathclaws take two shots from the strongest gun in the game, five shots from the strongest shotgun in the game. So there was something to be feared, and a smart player would buy special armor piercing rounds or explosive ammo to allow them to kill a deathclaw in one shot when using a stealth bonus. High level enemies also used high tier guns, making them always a threat in direct conflict a last resort. It encouraged you to plan your attack or position yourself so you could deal as much damage as possible without getting hit. In Fallout 4, it's much more like, Yeehaw! After we kill these Nazis, I'm gonna go nuts deep in my sister! Because you never feel threatened by them and even enemies of skulls next to their name just require a few extra shots to kill. If you use Psycho Jet, they can shoot or hit you twice, while you can empty 12 shotgun shells into them. And if you get a shotgun that shoots 2 bullets for the price of 1 at the same time, you're practically unstoppable. Enemies and their damage don't level up with you, so unless you step on a trap or have multiple people shooting you at the same time, you're not going to have much of a challenge. I think I've died 5 times over 60 hours. Not because I'm good, but because it's easier to stay alive, and most enemies quickly become weaker than you either due to sheer level numbers, drug abuse, or weapons. Overall, I think the game balance in this is some of the worst I've seen in a game. I never felt like I was in danger, and most of the time I was standing at the top of the screen waiting for the health bar to drop to zero. Now I've only done a few side quests I've stumbled across, such as the Death Claw and Sailor Museum, killing the raiders at Libertaria, and the quest to work out what's in the canned meat. I've wiped out at least 5 super mutant bases, and yet nothing is mentioned about my character. I mention this because it's I'm starting to sound like a broken record. Fallout New Vegas had people talk about your achievements, whether it was directly your name or rumours of your achievements. Even a side quest to train 4 misfit soldiers is put into the end credits, which really made it feel like your choices mattered. In Fallout 4, Anything outside the main quest doesn't feel like it matters at all. The world hasn't changed one bit since I've played, despite my level, and I haven't even seen any since start spawning outside the main quest. One of the things boasts about in the launch of Fallout 4 is the fact that Fallout 4 has a bigger map, has more cities to explore, and is denser than previous games. 
This is only true on a surface level. Although there are more suburbs to walk through, only about 1 in 7 buildings you can actually enter and explore. So these buildings act more, as, more of as hallways. The map definitely has less open spaces than previous titles, but it doesn't feel any bigger than older games, and doesn't feel like it has much content. The other problem with these suburbs is that they are there purely to act as bases for super mutants or raiders, which goes into a bigger problem with world building. Fallout New Vegas had a story behind every building and locations in the map. In small buildings or shacks that have a few pages to give you a glimpse at the person who lived there. Or in bigger places like Black Mountain, there was a super mutant civil war waged there and you could choose to kill the new ruler. Jacob's Town was the opposite. It was a refuge for super mutants, night kin and anyone who would want to live peacefully. Nipton was a town burned by Legion, and you could go through each building, finding out what happened and what the people were like. In Fallout 4, if you're lucky, you'll have one terminal or scrap bit of paper that might talk about a prototype or toy made there. There's nothing else to make the place feel a lie. Not even anything like an affair or talk about budget cuts. Most of these buildings look the same and have a similar layout, with nothing in them but enemies to kill in them, because most unique weapons are bought, and with no story to uncover in these buildings, there's nothing to stop them from just being a dungeon to grind through for loot. Once you've got some of the best gear, all you can do is hope for the randomly generated legendary weapons. With such a hollow world and bad balancing, it's hard to find reasons to play the game after you've beaten the main story. In fact, after 20 hours, I had difficulty getting myself motivated to play the game just for this review. I can't rate the DLCs until I play them, but for the base game, I think it's a 7 for the initial 20 hours of play, especially if you follow the story. It's enough meat to keep you there going and the game has some really good cinematic moments, such as when you first get the power armor and you see a Deathclaw crawl out of the sewers and using a minigun to mow down raiders and kill the Deathclaw. However, these moments are just spectacle and aren't the overall experience of the game. I think it was these early scripted moments and all this content you could access early on that gave it its high score. But when you can sink a lot of time in and analyse the entirety of the game, that score drops because you can see what's off the beaten path and how little there is to the game. It seemed to me as a popcorn game for people who have busy lives. They can come home, play for a couple of hours and not have to worry about forgetting something or what they were supposed to be playing. I think it's a 5 out of 10 because it functions and has its moments but I don't see the appeal for it over a long period of time. I will however say I only experienced a few glitches when playing, so they have, much, they have patched out most of its issues on PC at least. It's not worth my time, but I've given you all the information I can. So you make your own judgement, if it's cheap in a bargain bin, it might be worth the 10 or 15 dollars. With mods, you might be able to fix the game. Thanks for watching, I appreciate it. It looks like this has probably gone on for about half an hour. So you've got this far, GG, I appreciate it, you have the endurance to get here, have a good one, Dave O out.